The lesson today is let God be true. We continue in our series about how to study the Bible. Simple, if you will, or I try to make it simple, uh, on how to study the Bible, how to approach this book and understand it. It can be understood. It must be understood. And so we teach about it. We uh, spoke last time a bit about the right attitude towards Scripture, that you have a fear of God, that you have a respect for Him. Uh, today we look at the idea that God is right. And when we say let God be true, uh, what we mean by this is that you've got to read the book in such a way that you understand, uh, you expect that what God is saying here is accurate. Very often, uh, I think, very often what you find in the world is people uh, kind of assume that the Bible has to be proven or that, you know, it is riddled with inaccuracies or inconsistencies like any human uh, document any human history would be. And they approach the Bible in that way. And then when something happens that isn't perhaps fully explained or is not uh, perhaps compatible with our frame, excuse me, with our frame of mind or our philosophical or cultural bent, then we think, oh, well, this doesn't make sense. And that's a mistake. That's hubris. You're bringing that. Uh, you're bringing that frame to it. You should instead come to it and let it say what it says. Let God be true. In Romans 3, we have a passage, verses 3 and 4, where it's speaking about those who came before who were Jewish and served God. What if some of those people in the Old Testament were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though every one of them were a liar, as it is written that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. This quotation is from the psalm in which David understands that he sinned in the matter of Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. That David did this. He made this choice. God triumphs in judgment. He is not wrong. But what Paul is saying, or how he's using this, is to say, and it's true, it's a very common fallacy. Uh, the way that God is treating this is to say, uh, people come to it and think that the way those uh, who claim to be Christians behave reflects on the book that they claim to believe in, right? Or those who claim to be Jewish, the way they behave uh, reflects upon the scriptures that they hold to. Uh, and you would like to think that that's true. And I think you hear that fallacy today as well when people want to malign other religions. Um, but it's a fallacy. The idea that the, you know, the, the way people behave tells you something uh, that is you know, really binding and significant about the text is just not true. That's the devil's lie, which I would call that the um, imperfect incumbent. The person who holds the office, the incumbent, is imperfect. Uh, you know, it's not sinless. Therefore, people want to throw out the office. And if you, people will say, if you don't like the decisions of the president, that's why you should adopt anarchy. Well, no, that's why you should vote for somebody else, is what that is. Not, not anarchy. That's not the solution. The solution isn't to remove the office, get rid of it, as if it holds uh, no weight. It was a bad idea. It was the wrong thing to do. No. And the same is true for God's word. You don't abandon the scripture because somebody who says they believe it uh, acts in a way that is not consistent with it. 
uh, if you did that, you'd never believe in God. Because people don't, by and large, people don't do what it says, even though they say they do. So if some of them proved unfaithful, does that nullify the faithfulness of God? Well, no. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar. What if not a single person had been saved? Would that make the Bible less reliable? No. God is still true. It's an absolute standard outside of us. Well, that's the, the main point here. It has to be the case that God is right, and we have to read it in such a way that God is right. We, if it seems not right to me, the problem is not with God, the problem is with me. Uh, there's something that I don't understand about this, or there's something I don't remember. Now, if we keep going, there's another saying by Jesus in John 10 about the scripture cannot be broken. That's an interesting one that he says. Now, in this passage, in John 10, it's 30 through 36. He is teaching about the fact that he is one with the Father. He's claiming deity. I know people say that he never did that. See above. People do all kinds of things that the Bible doesn't contain. Don't listen to them. Listen to the Bible. Jesus is claiming that he and the Father are one, which is, if it were blasphemy, if I were to say that I am God in the flesh, that would be a sin. That would be blasphemy. And under the old law, that would be worthy of death by stoning. That's why in John 10, 30, when Jesus said, I and the Father are one, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. That's an appropriate response if he, in fact, is not God. But he is. Jesus said, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? His point is, I cannot do these miracles without God. The reason for these is that I'm saying something that is a stonable offense, and I know that, but it's being backed up by God. God is bearing witness with these miracles that this is true. They answered, it's not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Uh, which is, you know, better would be like, because you, although you are just a man, make yourself out to be God. Well, he is making himself out to be God. He certainly said this, and that's the whole point of John's gospel. His answer, isn't it written in your law, I said you are gods? It's true. That's in the Psalms. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of the one the Father consecrated and sent in the world that he's blaspheming because I said I'm the Son of God? It's true. Their law, he said, this is, is it not written in your law? Because they claim to believe this book. But then when the book doesn't agree with them, they go forward anyway. Instead of stopping and thinking, you know, what I'm saying and what the book says are not compatible. I need to revisit my teaching. And it's true, those to whom the, the word came were called gods, in the sense that when the word of God came to them and they put it forth, it proved to be true because it wasn't their own word. It was God's word. And as people listened to them from other nations or people who had not previously known God's law, they were effectively gods. They were giving the words of life that needed to be given. Not that they should be accorded deity or treated with that kind of... Uh, uh, the same kind of fear or respect you would show for God. It was a metaphor describing the fact that their word was not their own. It was God's. And as such, it was binding authority. So he's saying, if the scripture says this, why can I not say that I'm the son of God when I am consecrated and sent into the world by him as evidenced by the miracles that I am doing? That's all he's saying. This is not consistent. You're Belief is not consistent. There are things in this word that would challenge what you're saying now. And rather than being reconciled to God and making God be right, let God be true. 
You continue with your own way of looking at this and your own tradition about this instead. So that's the mistake that we're trying to avoid. We ought to approach it in such a way that when we read it and we see there something that is not what we were thinking or doing or whatever, that we listen to it. We bring ourselves into conformity to the word, not the other way around. Like too often people's mistake in reading the Bible is they're, they're going to it looking for some specific thing. Well, it's a rather long book and complex. Whatever you're looking for is probably in there somewhere. But is that really what it's saying? But you don't know if you've never stopped to let it talk and tell you what it's saying. The testing of Abraham. We want to look at this together now. It's a bit lengthy, but I think it's, this is the important thing, and this is the lesson in Genesis uh, 21 uh, and 22, but specifically 22 is the main thing. What happens here, of course, the Lord blesses Abraham because of his faith, because he got up, left his family and his homeland, and went to a place he did not know and he had not seen that God told him to do, and he did it by faith. He was also blessed to have a child when he was 100 and Sarah was 90-something, which is miraculous, yes. The child is Isaac, the child of promise, meaning the child who was born by faith. It wasn't possible for them to do this in the flesh. This was by faith. That child, God later tells him to go to a specific place location and offer him in sacrifice this is about why uh this is about testing abraham right which means that we ourselves are being tested but what this is about is what hebrews 11 said about abraham he reckoned that god was able to raise him from the dead that reckoning that's let god be true that's what we're saying it seems, perhaps, on the surface that, hey, why would you be doing this? Didn't you bless me with this child miraculously? Isn't this the one who's supposed to be the heir, according to promise? And now you want me to kill him? See, the worldly mind would say, well, this, is, this can't be real. This God shouldn't be listened to. And what kind of God would accept human sacrifice anyway? As you hear brethren say, I dare say that's blasphemy. Jesus was human. But um, the world thinks in this way, and perhaps people turn away from this and say, yeah, that wouldn't be real. That's not what Abraham did. Abraham said, no, I don't get it, but let God be true. What he's saying to do is the thing to do. And so that's what we're looking for. We're told in Genesis 21, 8 to 13, the child grew, that is Isaac, Isaac, and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day he was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, laughing. There, the child of the natural birth process, Hagar, is laughing meaning heckling. And she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman will not be heir with my son Isaac. The thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. Well, he did. He loved his son Ishmael. He didn't want to send them away. And yet, it was true she was a slave woman. He had had children or a child by her, not by his wife. And now this child has come by promise from God and is the heir. Okay, he doesn't like it. But God said to him, do not be displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. Because through Isaac will your offspring be named. 
So the reckoning of his lineage is going to go through Isaac. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So Ishmael is offspring of Abraham. And because of this and the earlier blessings, he will be blessed. He will be made into a great nation as well. That is true. But the name, the reckoning, the lineage is through Isaac, because that's the son of promise, the miraculous son that God gave them. Which is visited again in Galatians, if you're of a mind. Now, Genesis 22, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So like his leaving his homeland, he's going somewhere that is imprecise. He doesn't know exactly, but he's going to listen to God when he does and do what God tells him when he gets there. He rose early in the morning, we are told. This Abraham did not delay to carry out the order. He saddled his donkey, took two of his young men, that is his servants, with him and his son Isaac, cut the wood for the burnt offering, arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Also interesting, I think, that it's a three days journey to get there, where he is going to ostensibly sacrifice his son. But we know in retrospect from Hebrews 11 that he expected his son to be resurrected from the dead. Interesting, don't you think, that it takes them three days to get to this place where he will offer his son, expecting him to be raised from the dead. How do you know that he expected him to be raised? It is right here in Genesis 22. He told the servants, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. He had every intent of returning to the servants in the parking lot <laughs> with the boy whom he was about to go sacrifice. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, though he took the fire and the knife. Also interesting, don't you think, that the father has the means of death and the son is carrying his own wood on which he is to be killed. So they went both of them together. That's how it worked. They're together in this. They're father and son. One is the leader, the father. The other is the, the, the uh, subordinate, the son, who's being subject to his father. And he said, Isaac, to his father, my father, he said, here I am, son. Everybody's calling Abraham. <laughs> Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Ah, sharp boy, Isaac. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Abraham knew God's going to take care of this. That is, let God be true. That's what we mean. He did not assume that this was wrong, that God was bad, that he was holding out on us, not telling us something, not trustworthy. That's the lie of the devil to Eve. Well, yeah, he doesn't want you to eat the fruit because he knows in the day that you eat of it, you will become wise like he is. Right? He's holding out on you. There's something else there. You shouldn't trust him. That's the devil. Abraham was not like that. He did trust God, even though it seemed dire. God will provide for himself the lamb. <laughs> okay, so they went. <laughs> and they came to the place of which God had told him. Abraham built the altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound up Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife 
to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham. But see, he took the knife. He was about to slaughter him. Which means in God's mind, he's as good as dead. He did this. Abraham, said the angel of the Lord. He said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy. Do, don't do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And people have tripped and stumbled all over. Now I know. <laughs> How did God not know before this? Well, it's this pesky thing called free will. We have it. And part of the deal on free will is God, evidently, having the power to choose not to know. He gives us a real choice. We get to decide whether we're going to obey him or not. I don't know how it works exactly, but I'm not God. There's a lot of things he does that I don't know how they work. I mean, there's things that engineers do that I don't know how they work. We traveled back in time. We, I could never make a TV. Uh, and nobody, everybody would think I was crazy trying to describe electricity or airplanes. <laughs> this guy's nuts. No, there's a lot of things I don't understand, and that's okay. But he said, now I know that you fear God. He tested Abraham, meaning... We get a choice in the matter, and he does choose to let you choose. He chooses not to know what you're going to do. Um, compare Genesis 6, uh, where it repented him that he made man, says King James. He was sorry that he had made man. I always remember the observation of a little boy named Gavin. He said, he said to me, he was probably expecting something better. That's right. That's exactly right. That's what it means. Now I know you fear God. Well, so it is. He did not withhold his son, his only son. Hmm. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Well, in Hebrews 11, again, as we mentioned earlier, by faith, Abraham, being tested, offered up Isaac, 17th verse says. He offered him. It's good as done. And he who had received the promises was in the process of offering up his only son, of whom it had been said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. So here we are in Genesis 22 watching this. He's going, he's doing it, he's raising the knife to kill this child who was the one given by promise, who was the one said to be the, the, the name of the heirs. And he's a child, he doesn't have any children. That's what's happening. He trusted God so much that he was willing to do that because, we're told, he reckoned or considered, but reckoned that God was able even to raise him from the dead. See, it's actually simple. <laughs> I think, well, this is a complex problem. How could God be asking him to do this? And, well, what would he be expected to do, and how would this be received? Or you, get, you can go crazy with the anxiety living in the future there, not knowing. Or you can join Abraham, who said, well, you know, God has never lied to me before. He is all-powerful. He must be going to, and he told me that he was going to be the, the heir, and he's not old enough to have children yet, so he must not be dying. I'll offer him, and God will raise him from the dead. Simple. From which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Figuratively speaking, that's my authority for pointing out the likeness to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's clear that's what is meant by it. He, he reckoned God could raise him from the dead, which from which he did receive him back. Yes, on the third day he was raised again. Sure, of course, what else would they do? <laughs> Jesus said this book was written about me. Do you think he meant 
the gospel of John? No, he meant the Bible. In Acts 26, finally, I will close with these words from Paul, standing on trial, as he said, I stand here on trial, Acts 26, verses 6, 7, and 8, because of my hope and the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12, our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. For this hope, I'm being accused by the Judeans, of king. So he's in a, a human court in Judea. Why are they attacking me? Well, it's because of this hope. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Ah. See, and you thought Paul was on trial. No, my friend, you are on trial. Why don't you trust God? Why do you think that it's impossible for him to raise the dead? This is no reason to turn away. No reason to stop. Now somebody would say, I thought this was about Bible study. Well, it is. People are getting hung up on, well, you know, what year was he born, really? And, you know, uh, history shows us that Herod died in, you know, maybe 4 B.C., you know, you'd have Jesus being born in 6 B.C. Like, yeah. What about it? What does that prove? <laughs> and they will say, well, you know, the, his, the record uh, of the New Testament is not accurate. And I would say, well, no, the calendar is not accurate. That's all. <laughs> Simple. Well, how could that be? Well, how could it not be? It's being kept by men. Is there some single lineage that goes all the way back to 1 AD? Rome was felled. You know, the Colosseum that they built with the gold of the temple, when they sacked it in Jerusalem in 8070, they took that money and used it to build the Colosseum in Rome. And they made the Jewish slaves they took from Jerusalem to build it. They were we don't know, but it's reasonable to assume they would have been the first people in that Colosseum as well. Because uh, the Romans are jerks. kind of hate them. Um, this idea of the Colosseum is something that was well beyond the conception of anybody who lived afterward when Rome collapsed. And we're talking Dark Ages, 500s, 600s. The poverty, you know, the, the nothingness and the poverty was unimaginable. The Colosseum did not fall into ruin. It was taken apart brick by brick by the poor who lived in the land all around it. They did not know what it was. They did not know who built it or how that was even possible. They just knew that they needed something to hold their tent down in the wind. So they went and grabbed those nice chiseled rocks and took it apart brick by brick for that purpose. That's what happened. Okay, so, no. Uh, the idea <laughs> that there's some kind of unbroken lineage all the way back, that's false. No. It's not the calendar that is right and God the, and his Bible have to be proven. It's the other way around. God is right and the rest of us have to be proven. Why should it be thought incredible that God raises the dead? True. Why would we think that his power is limited? What does it have to do with the word? Well, it has everything to do with it because the problems of what year was that and is the calendar right are much smaller problems than that guy was dead. And he's not dead anymore. There is not science for that, and there never will be, by definition. People are so worried about the dinosaurs and the plate tectonics and the age of the earth. And, you know, I don't know how to explain everything that looks the way that it looks or has an appearance of what it has an appearance of in the earth. I don't know, but I do know what the word of God says about it. And God must be right, though every man be a liar. And yet, 
you see among the Christians, among the churches, people being very apologetic about it and trying to find ways to make the account that God gave us of how he made the world compatible with the account that science, some science, wants to uh, hold on to. Okay, uh, I understand you don't want to be thought stupid and you don't want to be kicked out of school. I understand that. But there's no reason to think that we are right and God is wrong about this. And it's a much smaller problem than resurrection from the dead. Maybe you will reconcile the timelines. Maybe you will reconcile the, uh, the sequence of events in some way. I don't, I don't see it. Nobody actually misunderstood this until about the 1800s when uh, the West decided that the earth was a lot older than the Bible said. Until then, everybody understood Genesis 1 and 2 exactly alike. Funny how that is. Um, but you're, you're not going to find anything harder than somebody to be crucified, Roman style, and come back to life. That's just not possible in human terms. But with God, all things are possible. So whatever it is in the Bible that you come across that you think is difficult or doesn't make sense or seems inconsistent, okay, give it a chance. Give God a chance. Let God be true and work through that. And, and you know, let's talk about it. Maybe I've seen it too, or maybe I haven't, and we'll work through it together. Whatever. But let God be true. And think about the seriousness of the resurrection from the dead. That's the real problem. If you're minded to stay within the flesh, to stay within the earthly way of reckoning, but if you're spiritually minded, then this book is for you and you can gain much from it. Now today, if you are not yet a child of God, it is time to become a Christian. If you believe in Jesus Christ, that he is the son of God, we have here uh, many who are willing to help you to obey the gospel of Jesus, to be baptized in his name for forgiveness of sins. If you believe in the resurrection from the dead, you Believe as well that you can change and be a different person. You can put to death the old person and be resurrected in the spirit to be a new person, a Christian, trusting in God. Though we may not know what lies ahead, we know that God is true. And he will be faithful and he will be by our side from here forward. If you are a Christian who has not lived right, let us pray for you that you might be restored to him. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized in his name, let it be known now. While together we stand and sing the song selectively.